It's the start of a brand new year, and you all know what that means. A brand new Builder roster. But not just any Builder roster. You see, we've got a tradition on this show. Every January, we take a franchise or a company, and we build a roster for a brand new Smash Bros. style game all around them. We did it for indie games, we did it for Sega games, but this year, we're breaking out our comedically large Duke controller, pulling a couple of cold ones out of the fridge, getting in touch with our inner frat boy, as we create a Smash roster for the Xbox. and welcome to another episode of Build the Roster, the show where we take a hypothetical fighting game and build our dream roster around it. And ever since we started this once a year Smash tradition, heck, scratch that, ever since we started this show, this has been one of our most requested episodes. I mean, Nintendo invented the Smash formula, Sony tried their own take on it, so it would only make sense that Microsoft would take a crack at it as well. What's the point of having console wars if everyone can't rip each other off? However, I'll admit, even though people have been requesting this episode for almost three years now, I was still nervous to make it because, let's be honest, Xbox doesn't have the massive library of characters and series that Nintendo or PlayStation does, so I don't even know if this episode is possible. I mean, can we really fill in an entire roster for an Xbox Smash game? Oh, right! The monies! I forgot about. The monies. Yeah, as I said a few years ago when people started requesting this, I thought, I don't know if there's enough here to make a whole roster around it, at least not a really interesting one for a wide variety of series. Cut to the present day where I'm frantically shaving names off this list to try and keep this roster from being obscenely bloated. Yes, over the last few years, Microsoft has been buying up one franchise after another, which does raise several concerns about monopolies in video games and putting too many companies under one roof that is really depressing to think about, but that ain't what this show is about. No, this is the show that says, listen, giant corporations, if you're going to hoard all of your toys for yourself, then can you at least do something cool with them, like put them all in a fighting game or something? And that's what we're going to do today. But you know, speaking of money, Now's a good time to let everyone know that we've officially launched a Patreon. Yes, people have been asking us to make a Patreon for years now, so it's finally happened. And I thank everyone who signed up so far, and if you want to join, then follow the link in the description down below. There you can get access to polls to help us decide what videos to make next, as well as early looks at upcoming videos. I'm sorry for that super awkward segue, but like I said, we just launched this thing, so yeah, I'm going to be shoving it into conversations a whole lot for the next few months. Also, while we're talking about what's going on with this channel, I just want to take a moment real quick to mention that last year we managed to reach our goal of 50,000 subs, and I just want to say thanks again to everyone who helped make that possible. This year our goal is 80,000, so if you haven't subscribed yet and you enjoy what you're seeing, then think about clicking that sub button down there. I really would appreciate it. But back to the topic at hand. Yes, today we will be taking all the various franchises that Microsoft has been scooping up, put them in a big pot, and make a brand new Smash stew. Although, I am going to remind everyone of something right here at the top. At the time of this recording, Microsoft is still in the process of attempting to buy up Activision and Blizzard, but it hasn't actually happened yet. In fact, just a month ago, the British and American governments both announced that they were going to take steps to investigate this merger, which could stall or even flat out cancel the proposed deal. So we have no idea if Activision or Blizzard will be joining the other Microsoft tiles in that giant Uncle Scrooge vault of theirs. And because of that, I'm not going to put any Activision or Blizzard characters in this roster. Which is honestly great for me because it means I don't have to keep going on about the depressing reality of monopolies in video games and also the way that Activision and Blizzard have treated their employees, which is a stink that is impossible to wash off any of their towels and also I don't know anything about Call of Duty, but mostly I'm leaving it out because the deal hasn't gone through yet. Now as always, we have to start off by asking how many characters will be in this game, and last year we kind of went overboard with the Smash roster. We did a complete one for one with Smash Ultimate coming up with a Sega alternate reality take on the series but we're not going to get that crazy this time. No, today we're going to be a bit more realistic and look at some other recent Smash clones. 
When PlayStation attempted their Smash game, it launched with 20 characters. When Nickelodeon did their Smash game, 20 characters. Warner Brothers put out multiverses, and currently there are 23 characters in there. But six of those characters were added after launch. Except that they didn't, because technically the game still hasn't launched yet, because this is still considered to be early access. God, the world of video game releases has become needlessly complicated. Point is, however you want to count it, Multiverses is around 20 characters as well. So yeah, today for our Microsoft Smash game, we're going to set the starting roster at 20. Kind of. Because there's something that Smash Bros. has that many other Smash clones miss. And it's one of the best things about Smash. Echo Fighters. Smash has rosters that are gigantic compared to other series. And that's because Smash knows how to reuse assets. And that includes the Echo Fighters. Characters who fight almost exactly the same as another character, just with a few altered stats or one new move here or there. So in that same spirit, today our roster is going to be 24 characters, 20 regular, and 4 Echo Fighters. Also, I'm going to throw in a couple of special rules just for today's roster. Microsoft now owns a ton of properties, so many beloved iconic titles, and a lot of them star grizzled dudes carrying around guns. But a Smash game needs to have variety to these characters, and characters who, for lack of a better term, just feel like they would fit in a platform fighter. You fill this roster with 20 gruff gun-toting dudes, eventually you're gonna have to ask, why is this a platform fighter? Aren't those typically, like, way more lighthearted and wacky? So when making this roster, I'm going to try and put together a wide variety of characters. Because of that, there might be a few extra oddball picks in here, there might be some big iconic faces who get left out, because otherwise, this is just a bunch of Punishers running around blowing each other up, and that's great if Microsoft wants to make a brand new Quake game, not so good for a brand new Smash game. Also, I've been referring to this as Microsoft Smash the whole time, but it ain't really that. It's X-Smash. Nope, going to definitely need to think of a better name than that. Point is, it's a Smash just for Xbox, which means there might be some characters in here who don't come from a game owned by Microsoft, but they still come from a game that isn't exclusive to Xbox or has some kind of a special connection just to that console. But that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's been a while since we had an episode with such an easy roster size and so few restrictions and rules. I'm sure that means the rest of this video is going to go just as smoothly. Cue the video not going smoothly and falling apart in three, two, one. Master Chief. Yeah, let's go ahead and get the most obvious choice out of the way right now. Master Chief is Microsoft's Mario. Just with way bigger guns and a very different type of flood. Some of the younger fans out there might not remember it, but when the original Xbox came out, people were looking at it thinking, who are these guys? Thinking they can just come in here and start a brand new console in this day and age. But when Halo released, it changed things. Everywhere you went, people were talking about Halo. It is one of the biggest examples of a console seller I've ever seen. And I don't think it's exaggerated to say this game is the main reason the Xbox was able to succeed. Heck, I didn't even play first person shooters back then and even I bought this thing. So yeah, Master Chief has to be in here. And considering how many weapons he carries around, he'd be a big zoner point out multiple iconic guns throughout the series, we wouldn't be able to give him all the weapons people are probably hoping for simply because there's just so many. But remember, this is a Smash game, and that includes items. So you know there would be plenty of weapons that you could drop all throughout the stage for the other players to pick up and carry around. And while we're talking about Halo, let's go ahead and make Cortana the host of the game. Have her greet you on the home screen, have her read off the menu as you navigate it, announce the winners, she would be your guide to this game. At least by default. You could unlock other characters to be announcers by pulling off achievements because, yeah, fighting games need more cosmetic unlockables, and new announcers from various other series would be a great touch. But we're not done with Master Chief just yet. As I said, this game will have four Echo Fighters, and what's the only way to get more Master Chief in your Xbox crossover game? 
with another Master Chief. Our first Echo Fighter is going to be Noble Six. Okay, now hold up. I know a lot of people are throwing out their own favorite Spartan as a contender, but let me explain. Halo Reach received some of the highest scores of any game in this series, easily being the highest reviewed spin-off game. And Echo Fighters have adjusted stats from the characters that they're built from, and for Noble Six, it's actually pretty simple. Halo Reach introduced armor abilities, including a sprint. So, make Noble Six weaker than Master Chief, but he moves faster. But here's the real big reason why I'm picking Noble Six. As I said, I'm sure everyone has that one Spartan that they would love to throw in here as an Echo Fighter for Master Chief, but in Halo Reach, you follow an entire squad, Team Noble. Why am I bringing this up? Because I say we make this Echo Fighter not just Noble Six, we make it all of Team Noble. If this game is just like Smash and each character gets eight colors, make colors one, two, and three different colors for Noble Six. Then colors four through eight would be the other five members of Team Noble. I know someone is going to say that wouldn't work because these characters wouldn't fight the same, but these aren't five extra Echo characters that I'm pitching here, they're just alternate skins as a nice easter egg. This is a Smash game, it's all about fan service and squeezing in as many characters as you can, and giving Noble Six five other costumes that each resemble the other characters from Team Noble would be a perfect way to do that. But alright, that's enough for Master Chief, let's go ahead and move into our second full character, and our third character overall, who is also going to be our eighth Halo character. This roster just started and I've already made it needlessly complicated. <laughs> the Arbiter. Okay, just to get out of the way right here at the top. Arbiter is the towel bestowed upon the mightiest Sangheili warrior, but when we say Arbiter here, we're obviously referring to Thelva Dom, who has been a major recurring character in Halo, practically being the co-protagonist of Halo 2, and he's voiced by Keith David, so of course we have to put him in this game. I'm this close to including Spawn in this roster just because he's also voiced by Keith David, and he was the Xbox exclusive character for Soul Calibur 2. So there is a connection. I'm not exactly sure what the connection is, maybe it's that Spawn is also constantly leaking out green energy, but back to Thelvadon. I had to clarify we were using Thel because even though it might seem obvious, when the Arbiter appeared as a guest character in Killer Instinct, it was just a random Sangheili. I mean, maybe there's someone from deep in the lore, but I've looked into it and I think it was just some new character they made just for Killer Instinct. However, we could easily make that KI Arbiter an alternate costume for this Arbiter. And the fact that the Arbiter was already in a fine game works really well for us because even though Killer Instinct and Smash are very different types of games, we can take some of his basic attack animations from there and use them for inspiration for his basic attacks in here. And of course he would use plenty of Covenant weapons including the Energy Sword for all of his basic attacks. However, that Energy Sword is so iconic and important to Halo, you know it would also be an item in this game that any character could pick up and use. As I get further into this roster, I just want you guys to imagine some of the more cartoony characters I'm going to be listing off, slicing people up with one of these giant energy swords. Marcus Phoenix. If there is any other Xbox series that could possibly rival Halo for the most important franchise on that console, it's Gears of War, so you better believe we're going to include a handful of heroes from there as well. First up is obviously the original protagonist, Marcus Phoenix. Now as for how he'd fight, he'd use several of the standard weapons from the classic Gears games, the Lancer, the Bolo Grenade, and of course his big ultimate super would be him raining down destruction with the Hammer of Dawn. But here's the really unique idea I have for Marcus. You see, the Gears games revolutionized cover-based shooters, so much so that everyone after that tried to replicate it. No matter what game you were playing at that time, you were bound to walk into a room that was full of waist-high cover. So here's what I'm thinking. Like with Smash, you would have specials linked to different directions. So, let's say that Marcus's down special is him hunkering down as a slab of wall rises up in front of him. While he's in this stance, he'd be immune to projectiles coming from the front, and he could fire shots back at the opponent with his normal attack button. But you would be leaving yourself wide open to attacks from behind, and he'd have to exit this stance to start moving again. So, if you're fighting a zoner, then you're set. But there would still be a big blind spot to this defense. And just like Halo, Gears of War was so important to the Xbox and its popularity that we have to give Marcus an Echo Fighter. And this was a tough one because there are so many other Gears that would be perfect for this role. But I have to pick one. 
I know that with Noble Sex, I said that we could include five other characters as alternate costumes, but that's because we wouldn't have to show their faces. But if we put multiple gears in here as alternate skins, then that would include facial animations, more voice lines, it would take way more work. So I have to pick just one. And if I had to take a guess, I think Baird might be more popular? But I gotta go with Cole. I remember when those early games were coming out, Coltrane was such a big star. His personality was dynamic and it would be perfect to make him stand out in this game. And he's not even the only other Gears character I'm going to throw in here, because next up is... Kate Diaz. As I said, Gears is so big for Xbox that we need at least two full characters, not just one character and an Echo Fighter. So who better to go with than the protagonist of the most recent Gears game? Yes, Kate first appeared in Gears 4, but in Gears 5, it continued her cliffhanger ending and let her take center stage as she tried to learn about her connection to the enemy. And let's just say it's kind of a big connection. Now, I was tempted to make Kate the Echo Fire from Marcus, but yeah, that plan kind of fell through pretty quick. For starters, since Kate first appeared in Gears 4, that means we could load her up with completely different weapons since 4 and 5 both featured so many new additions, like the Breaker Mace that she could use for all of her regular attacks that would give her slightly larger range on her normals. But also, Echo Fighters do have adjusted stats from the fires that they're based on, but Marcus and all the other characters from the first game move like a boulder on legs. They are heavy. Kate would be much lighter and faster than them. So much so that when it comes to jumping, something very important to a platform fighter, they'd have completely different animations. I mean, Kate could probably actually get some air on her jumps, while Marcus would be very hard to launch, but once you got him off the side, he would sink like a stone. So when you consider the fact that Kate's stats would be so different from Marcus, and when you combine that with the fact that she would have a good reason to have completely different specials from him, that just says to me that she should be her own character. So alright, we got six characters out of the way so far, and so far they're all big buff bang bang shoot 'em up characters. At this point, we're not making a Smash clone, we're making the sequel to Broforce. So let's change the tone up a bit with our next character. Steve. How can we not include Steve from Minecraft? Seriously, it's Minecraft. It's literally the biggest game on the planet. In 2020, it was estimated to have 131 million people actively playing it every month. That is an accomplishment that no other game comes even close to. Hell, Fortnite is one of the biggest gaming juggernauts in the history of mankind, and its active monthly user base is around 4 million. Minecraft still to this day towers over all other games when it comes to active player numbers. And Microsoft owns it. So heck yeah, let's put Steven here. And his moves that wouldn't be all that hard to figure out because lucky for us, Sakurai already put him in Smash Bros. So yeah, let's just copy and paste that idea into this game. By the way, can we just take a moment to point out how crazy it is that after adding Steven to the game, they went back and had to figure out the material that every single square inch of every single one of their stages would be made of? That blows my mind and I still don't believe that the Smash team gets enough credit for that. So Steve is a no-brainer and you know what? Let's keep that going. Again, Minecraft, biggest game in the world, one of the biggest money makers for Microsoft, why would we not include another character in this game? Next Echo Fighter is going to be Alex. Now, this Echo Fighter is going to be a bit different because when it comes to their stats, I can't really think of any reason to change them around. They would have the same attack, defense, weight, so some of you might be wondering, why isn't Alex just going to be an alternate skin like she is in Smash Bros? Well, because the thing that we're going to be changing up for this Echo Fighter is their specials. In Minecraft, there's so many different tools and weapons that you can craft, so let's just give a handful of them to Steve and a handful of them to Alex. Steve can craft a pickaxe as a weapon, Alex can craft a sword. Steve can craft a bow and arrow, Alex can craft dynamite, stuff like that. So all their normals would be the same, but they would each have four unique specials, making them a very different type of Echo Fighter while sharing enough moves with each other that they still count. All right, that's six down mean that we got 18 more to go. And you know what? Speaking of other Microsoft characters already in Smash Bros. <laughs> Banjo and Kazooie. Yeah, this one was another no-brainer. Microsoft owns Rare, so that means that they have access to their massive library of IPs. And out of all of them, arguably the most beloved duo is Banjo and Kazooie. 
People spent years begging for Banjo to be in the official Smash, and the cheers of him finally joining were legendary. So you would be insane to not bring him into an Xbox Smash. But here's the big question. Banjo had one game that was unique to the Xbox, and it is probably his most... Well, I don't want to say hated, so let's go with... Malazed game. Yeah, Nuts and Bolts didn't do all that well when it was released, but this is the Xbox Smash game. So, should we include a reference to it in here? Well, I think it would be okay to include his blocky Nuts and Bolts design as an alternate costume for him, but beyond that, yeah, I think we should just stick with moves that are references to his classic games. But if we do want a new piece of fan service to shove in this game, remember how I said Cortana would be the main guy to the game's menus and the narrator? Let's say if you beat Arcade Mode with Banjo and you get a high enough score, you could unlock Banjo Speak for the narrator. Then the menu guide and all the in-game narration is now replaced with this. <laughs> Heck, if we give each character in the game win quotes, we could replace those with Banjo Speak as well. Don't tell me you wouldn't want to play a game where John DiMaggio as Marcus Phoenix says all of his victory lines like this. That just sells the whole game by itself. Rash. Let's continue hanging up those rare properties, and next I'm going to bring out the Battletoads. Yeah, Battletoads was another beloved franchise back in the day, and by beloved I mean bone-crushingly difficult, but no matter how much it kicked your butt, if you were a kid back in the early 90s, then you still remember the Battletoads. And hey, Microsoft did recently bring them back after all these years for a brand new game. A game that admittedly kind of split audiences, but hey, it does mean that they are back in the public eye, so I do think that they deserve a spot. And I'm going to go with Rash because A, he's the leader of the team, and B, he was also in Killer Instinct, so he's already guest starred in the last big Xbox crossover game. Although for this game, we're going to be using a very different moveset for him. All of his normal attacks from his old game will now be his basic attacks, with each of his transformation hits now being his charged smash attacks but his specials will allow him to call out the other two Battletoads to help him pound away the enemies as assist attacks, so that way all three of them can get some screen time. So, that makes yet another Microsoft character who guest starred in Killer Instinct. So you know what? Let's just go ahead and address the next most obvious series. Fulgore. You know we had to put some Killer Instinct representatives on here. Out of all the old rare tiles that Microsoft has tried to bring back on the Xbox, it's probably the only one that wasn't just well received, but might be better than the classics. Yeah, the Killer Instinct reboot from 2013, holy crap that was 10 years ago now, has become arguably the best game in the entire franchise, and to this day the cries of bring back KI can still be heard all over social media. Plus. This is a fine game, Killer Instinct is a fine game, how can you not include some characters from there? And first up is Fulgore. Yes, he might not have been the protagonist of the series, but this big metal man was everywhere back in the day. He was one of the earliest faces of the series, he's the one that brought all the hype to these games. So we'd give him most of his moves from the series, that's pretty obvious, but I got a real unique idea for something that we could include from KI. You know how in Smash Bros, if you hit the block button at just the right moment, then instead of blocking, you'll parry the opponent? Well, in Killer Instinct, you have your own unique way of stopping your opponent from attacking. Yeah, let's say that with any Killer Instinct character in this game, if they hit the block button in time to parry an oncoming attack, then instead of parrying it, you'll do a... and knock the opponent away. It wouldn't do any damage, but would get you some extra breathing room. And if you did it at the corner of the stage, then you could actually send the opponent flying off the edge. And just like with Banjo, all the Killer Instinct characters would come with another unlockable. If you beat the game with a KI character and got a high enough score, you could unlock the Killer Instinct announcer to provide commentary during the match. 
And yes, as I have been hinting all this time, Fulgor wouldn't be our only KI fighter. Orchid. When it comes to picking the second KI fighter, it was a tough call. Saber Wolf was certainly popular back in the day, Hisako is the new hotness from the last game, Jago was the protagonist of the series, and even though he's one of the most boring fighting game protagonists ever, he does have Shadow Jago, which would be a great Echo fighter. But no, I remember what it was like playing KI back in the 90s. If you want to talk about which character was plastered everywhere back then, it was Orchid. She and Fulgore were absolutely the two biggest phases of the original game. And speaking personally, her theme in the old games was one of the first fighting game songs to get stuck deep in my brain. So yeah, throw Orchid in here and give her her classic and modern outfits as two different skins, and give her the combo breaker and unlockable announcer that come with Fulgore. Also, speaking of characters with great themes, the 2013 Killer Instinct has a legendarily good soundtrack. So screw it, let's put all the tracks from that game in here as unlockables too, because those songs are so good, they are worth fighting for. <laughs> Joanna Dark. I'm gonna peel back the curtain a little bit and reveal that Joanna Dark almost didn't make it onto this roster because, sure, her title on the Nintendo 64 was a very important game for the fifth generation of consoles, and I'd even say that her design is super famous and memorable and would fit in a game full of video game icons, and yes, Microsoft did announce that there is a brand new Perfect Dark game finally on the way. Maybe. Eventually. What's that, the studio that's working on it lost half their staff? Ah, well I'm going to choose to believe that a brand new Perfect Dark is finally on the way. But I still almost left her off because as I said, I don't want this roster to just be loaded full of humans running around with guns, and Microsoft owns a ton of humans running around with guns. But after a handful of frogs and bears and robots, I think we're safe to throw in another one. But also, Joanna isn't just some big gun-toting grizzled soldier, she's a spy. So, she could have a lot of maneuverability to flip and jump around the enemies, making her stand out from Master Chief, Marcus Minx, and a couple of other characters that are coming up later. She could also have some stealth-style attacks, such as disappearing and then reappearing behind the opponent, counter-attacks, the sort of moves that would fit the specific set of skills that a character like Joanna has built up over several years. The Sea of Thieves Pirates Okay. We're on to our final character from Rare's library, and I'll admit, it's the only one I don't really have any personal experience with. And yet, it's the one that needs to be included. I won't lie, when I saw that Rare was now working on a multiplayer open world pirate game, I was like, oh, well best of luck with that, because this doesn't look all that great, but hey, I'm sure someone's going to enjoy it. Cut to five years later, and that someone turned out to be a lot of people. That game continues to knock reviews out of the park, is getting tie-ins with massive movie franchises, and has a monthly player base of anywhere between 100 and 200,000 people. Something that I still can't believe no matter how many times I research it. So yeah, even though I don't play it myself, I would be insane to not include a representative from Sea of Thieves in here. But who to choose? Well. As I said, I don't play this game, so I don't have any personal knowledge of it, so I had to do a lot of researching for this spot, and after looking into it, I still didn't know who to include, because yeah, there's a lot of characters in here who seem really interesting, but I don't know which of these characters are really beloved by the fanbase, but that's when it hit me. Wait, the fanbase. Just put the fanbase itself in the game! Yeah, in Sea of Thieves, you have a creative character, so I have a wild idea. Well, if we just take a few basic standard pirate designs from the game as your fighter, but if you already play Sea of Thieves, then you could link your accounts together, and then you can just import your creative character from that game into here. I mean, if it works for the Mies and Smash, then I'm sure Xbox can figure out some kind of a way to make this happen. Again, Sea of Thieves has a huge player base. So if you tell them that they can take their pirate OCs and have them battle it out with other Xbox Legends, at least a couple of those players are going to be interested. Okay, we've done a few fun colorful characters, time to get back to the angry buff dude with weapons.
the Doom Slayer. Oh yeah, time to move on to the Bethesda titles, one of the biggest corners of Microsoft's gaming empire. So we have to include plenty of fires from those titles, and first up, and arguably the biggest face for Bethesda, Todd Howard, of course. No, I'm just kidding. He'll be an assist trophy who comes out and promises you that your life bar is fine and you're totally going to win this, and then he leaves without providing you with any kind of actual help. Anywho, the actual first fire that we're going to have is Doom Slayer. Who doesn't love the Doom Slayer? Heavy metal fans love the Doom Slayer. First person shooter fans love the Doom Slayer. Classic retro gamers love the Doom Slayer. Animal Crossing players love the Doom Slayer. He's been one of the most iconic gaming characters since the 90s, and the last two Doom games have brought him roaring back into the video game zeitgeist stronger than ever. I'm telling you, if you make an Xbox Smash game, and you put Master Chief fighting Doom Slayer on the cover, you just sold that game. They're already restocking the shelves now. Give him his shotgun, a chainsaw, and make the BFG his big ultimate super move. But I say we also give him a command grab. If you use this move normally, then the Doom Slayer would just grab the opponent and throw them. However, let's say that your opponent is over 100 health, because remember, this is a Smash clone, higher health equals bad. Let's say your opponent is over 100 health, and then you do a short combo on the enemy. After three hits in a row on the opponent when their health is this high, they'll start flashing. Then if Doom Slayer is able to land this command grab while they're still flashing, then the opponent would explode in a flash of light and sparks. This is obviously meant to represent the glory kills from the latest games, but we can't exactly have Doom Slayer ripping Banjo and Kazooie's heads off in gory detail. So instead, just have him pop in a big cartoony explosion. The Dovahkiin. Skyrim was one of the biggest games on the seventh generation of consoles. And the eighth. And the ninth. We're never getting another Elder Scrolls game, are we? Yeah, I don't need to explain to all of you the impact and the importance of Skyrim. It became one of the biggest video games of all time. So of course, we have to include your creator character, the Dovahkiin. All their basic attacks would come from their sword and shield. Fairly standard stuff. But then, all their special moves would be their various dragon shouts. So elemental attacks, breathing fire, summoning lightning. But their big super move would of course be their most iconic dragon shout, the Fushroda. I know that just a big shout that blows opponents back might not seem good enough to be your ultimate super move, but A, as I said, it is the most iconic shout in the game, and B, the Fushroda blows opponents away. And this is a platform fighter. In a game where the goal is to knock opponents off the screen, this move would be broken. You stand on one end of the screen while all of your opponents are on the other side of you, you could sweep the entire board in one move. <laughs> Cult. We got two Bethesda classics, but you can't just have older characters. You need that new star in here as well. So let's also throw in Cult, the protagonist of Deathloop. Deathloop was a big hit and was nominated for all kinds of awards but some people might still be scratching their heads on this one because that game launched as a PlayStation console exclusive. Yeah, this is like when Sony included Big Daddy in PlayStation All-Stars. It doesn't really make any sense for you to put a character that premiered on another console in your console's crossover fighting game. Except for one thing. After Sony got Arcane Studios to agree to make Deathloop a console exclusive, Microsoft, surprise, surprise, bought up Bethesda, and by extension, Arcane Studios. So I feel like this is almost mandatory as a way for Microsoft to say, hey, that series? Yeah, Deathloop, that's ours, okay? Yeah, don't you touch it. That's ours now, we own that. Plus, I think Colt could have a very unique moveset. He's got guns for obvious standing special attacks, a teleport for his up special recovery, but most importantly, Deathloop was sort of a roguelike where Colt had come down with a bad case of Groundhog's Day coming back to life again over and over every single time they died, starting the day off fresh. And when else are we going to have the opportunity to figure out how to work Groundhog Day powers into a fighting game? I say make his down special a sort of counter. He takes a stance, and if he gets hit in the stance, then he just teleports back to where he was right before he got hit with all the damage being negated. 
Might not really seem like that special of a counter, but if someone is about to hit you with something that you know will send you flying to your death, boom, Colt goes off the screen, it looks like he died, only for him to pop right back up like nothing happened and now he's ready to counterattack. Also, Colt wasn't the only character in that game with these unique powers. He was being hunted down throughout the entire game by Juliana. And one of the things that made her character so unique wasn't just the fact that she had the same unique abilities as Colt, it was also that other players out there in the world could control Juliana and then hop into your game and start hunting you down. So she is another playable character in that game who has the exact same powers as Colt. Let's go ahead and make Juliana the final Echo Fighter in this game. Maybe making her attack higher and defense lower because she was laser focused on taking Colt out while Colt had to sneak around and hide from her. So it would make sense that she would focus more on offense and he would focus more on defense. The Vault Boy. Okay. Let me explain. Fallout is another huge franchise for Bethesda, so we had to include someone from in there. But I doubt many of you were expecting The Vault Boy, but hear me out. First off, Fallout is another game where you create your own character to be the protag, and I don't know if you've noticed, but we've already got a lot of creative characters on here, and there's even a couple more coming up later on, so one of them had to be left out. And I know some of you might be thinking, then why not pick one of the other characters in the game? Good point, but did you see some of those other Bethesda characters? Doomguy, Cult, Juliana, that's a long line of humans carrying around weapons in first-person shooters. I mean, heck, if we're talking about realistic-looking humans that carry around weapons inside of a first-person shooter, you might as well include the Dovahkiin in there as well. Yeah, we need someone from Fallout to provide a very different tone and a very different character type. And more importantly, Smash is supposed to be a mascot fighter. And who is the mascot of Fallout? I'll give you a hint. It's the character we're talking about right now. Yeah, Vault Boy. He's the one that's always slapped all over every bit of merchandise for this franchise. Heck, he's literally the in-game mascot of the giant Vault Tech Corporation. But some of you still might be thinking, but how would he be a fighter? He just pops up in a few little skits to demonstrate your stats and abilities. And to you, I would say, you need to be more creative. We're basing this around Smash, the game that found a way to give We Fit Trainer and Duck Hunt Dog full-blown movesets. I could put a talking connect on this list and we could still find a way to make it work. Vault Boy has been depicted over multiple games holding different weapons, using different abilities. Sure, they're always meant to be cartoonish and exaggerated, but that doesn't mean that we can't translate them perfectly into moves. But that's it for all the Bethesda games. So we've got five more characters to go. And the rest of these will come from a wide variety of other titles and companies under Microsoft. A few more closely tied together than others, but they're all connected nonetheless. <laughs> Rasputin. Yes, folks, Microsoft also owns Double Fine as well. And if you have to pick one character to represent Double Fine, it's gotta be Raz from Psychonauts. Not only is this title probably the biggest hit this company has ever had, and its sequel was one of the most critically praised games of last year, but Raz's moveset was born to be put into a platform fighter. He's got his giant rubber ball bounce that he can use for his up special to recover and get back on stage, and he can also use that ball to float in the air, meaning that he would have some of the best aerial recovery in the entire game, and Psychonauts needs to be included in here just for all the supporting characters that we could bring in. Have Lily be an assist trophy, have Ford Crawler be an unlockable announcer, and just think about the interactions. Let's say you give each character an arcade ending where you see them meeting the other characters. Can you imagine Raz going into the minds of the other characters in this game? If anyone can help Marcus Phoenix with his truckload of issues, it's Raz. Or heck, have him go into the Doomslayer's head and it's just a peaceful little village full of cartoony bunny people. Crossovers are all about fun ways to see these different personalities come together, so Raz could bring so much to this game. Sparrow. It's been a while since Fable was a big name for gamers, but make no mistake, when this series was fresh, it was a big deal. In fact, I'll go ahead and reveal something from my own history here. This was the game that convinced me to buy an Xbox. 
I heard there was going to be a game that took place over the course of years and any and all decisions that you would make would shape not just the story but also the entire world and how it would grow and develop and my mind was blown. And I know I'm not the only one who felt that way. It's totally fair to say that Fable was another console seller for the fledgling Xbox. And sure, when I actually got my hands on the game, I quickly discovered, oh, Peter Molyneux is kind of a liar. Because, yeah, the game did not match the mountain of hype that he had been building up for it. But it was still good. You know a game is special when you realize you'd been lied to about it, but you still can't stop playing because it's just so fun. So considering how important Fable was to the early days of the Xbox, and considering that it is coming back with a brand new installment... Maybe. Eventually. How long ago did that announcement trailer come out? Anyway, Fable deserves some representation in here, and even though I mostly talked about the first game, I'd say the most iconic hero in the franchise is Sparrow from Fable 2. I mean, for starters, he actually has a name, so that counts for a lot. But also, I remember seeing his face plastered all over the place far more than the first hero. Not to mention, Sparrow had a dog, which would be a great way of keeping him different from your other standard sword and sorcery fighters. You could give him a special where he sends the dog out in a direction, but if there's no opponent in that direction, but there is an item, then the dog could grab that item and retrieve it for you and bring it back. Being able to play fetch with your dog and have them actually bring you items would be a great way to implement a dog into a Smash game. And of course, since Sparrow is a customizable character, we could load them up with tons of alternate costumes. Ryu Hayabusa Speaking of games that were really important to the early days of the Xbox, yes folks, I said I'm including characters from games that are owned by Microsoft, but also from games that are associated hand in hand with the Xbox. And these days when you think of Ninja Gaiden, you don't really associate with one console or another. But back in 2004, this hard as hell franchise came back to life as an Xbox exclusive, and it wouldn't go to another console for three years. Then when the sequel came out in 2008, it also released as an Xbox exclusive. And as I said, I bought my Xbox specifically for Fable, but as soon as I finished it and started looking for a new game, Ninja Gaiden immediately jumped to my attention. And Ryu Hayabusa would remain linked to the Xbox in multiple other ways. He's one of the most iconic characters in the Dead or Alive series, and Dead or Alive 3 and 4 were both exclusives for the Xbox. So if there's any third party character that I'd say deserves a spot in this game, it's Ryu Hayabusa. Plus, I've seen Ryu thrown around for years as a character that people want in the actual Smash Bros. So if Microsoft was putting together their own Smash, it would be a big feather in their cap if they could put him in here. And Ryu would play great in a platform fighter. Let's say you make that jumping slash attack of his his side special. That way if someone's trying to edge guard you so you can't get back into the platform, bam, you just cut clean through him. Ori. Here's the one I'm sure many of you were waiting on. Ori has become one of the biggest titles in the indie scene over the past few years. Although, do you still count as an indie game if you're owned by Microsoft? Point is, the Ori games have blown up. They're amazing, heartwarming, magical Metroidvania experiences that have recaptured what older fans love about this genre while introducing a whole new generation in them. So of course Ori has to be in here. Granted, we might have an anti-Ripley problem in here as Ori is meant to be this very tiny creature, so they would be the smallest character in the game, but I'm sure we could make it work. Also, Ori would be another super light and floaty character, making them easy to send flying, but they'd have a ton of recovery options and lots of maneuverability to avoid attacks. And between both games, they have so many abilities that you can pull from, such as their Spirit Edge Sword to give them longer normal attacks, the Spirit Arc for projectiles, and the Launch and Bash attacks for recovery specials. And that brings us to the final character, and if you're a fan of this show, then you all know there's one spot on this roster that we haven't hit yet. Say it with me, everyone. The Weird Pick. Sure, I've had a few curveballs here or there, but no really weird pick just yet. No, you need someone way out there to shock audiences, to get them talking, and just to keep the roster feeling interesting. However, my weird pick today might be the safest weird pick we've ever done because I've already seen a ton of other people making their own Xbox Smash rosters, and I've seen this character popping up on pretty much all of them. And I can't tell if that's because everyone is serious about it or if everyone just finds it hilarious, but I don't care. 
it's kind of the perfect weird pick, so we have to do it. Your final roster spot goes to... <laughs> Blinks the Time Sweeper. When the Xbox premiered, they needed a breakout title. They needed that game that would take on Sony and Nintendo. They needed a face. They needed that character who you would look at and think, Xbox. And that character would be... Master Chief. But back before Halo would go on to define the entire course of this console, Microsoft threw a lot of ideas at the wall. And I remember Blinks the times we were standing out among them because they pushed this character hard. The new face of Xbox, they called him. They thought this was going to be the character to topple Mario. They were so certain this was going to be the big Xbox star, they made sure to actually put an X in his name. They wanted to make sure that Blinks and the Xbox were going to go hand in hand forever. Cut to 20 years later, and the only thing Blinks is the face of is a Twitter account dedicated to cataloging poorly aged things. But darn, if Nintendo Smash can have Rob the Robot and PlayStation All-Stars can have the giant polygon man from their old ads, we can give Xbox Blinks. He's got the history with his company, and thanks to that Twitter account that I mentioned, he might actually be more popular now than he was when his game was actually released. Granted, not for any of the reasons that they wanted him to be popular, but people know him now. And let's be real, the moment that an Xbox crossover fine game gets announced, you know the number one joke everyone is going to make is going to be, So, is Blinks in the game? So yeah, let's put him in here just for the look on everyone's face when they realize, oh, oh, Blinks actually is in the game. Heck, have the whole story centered around him. The universe is being destroyed, so Blinks the Time Sweeper must use his time powers to assemble all these other fighters together. And honestly, I think Blinks has the potential to be a lot of fun this game. As I said, he's got time powers. There's a lot you can do with that concept in a platform fighter. And I kind of hope that's exactly what happens, because I would laugh hysterically if this game actually got made and Blinks the Times Weaver was at the very top of everyone's tier list. So there is your starting roster for X Smash. Still sounds weird, but too late to change it now. Alex Arbiter, Augustus Cole, Banjo Kazooie, Blinks, Colt, Doomslayer, Dovahkiin, Fulgore, Joanna Dark, Juliana, Kate Diaz, Marcus Phoenix, Master Chief, Noble Six, Orchid, Ori, Rash, Rasputin, Ryu Hayabusa, Sea of Thieves Pirates, Sparrow, Steve, and Vault Boy. In the end, it's a cast made up of representatives from almost every single core of Microsoft's properties, and we've got a pretty clean split right down the middle between more animated colorful mascots and grizzly humans just carrying around weapons. But as you know, we can never end things on just the main roster. No, we have to talk about DLC. But first, you know, it's been a little while since we went beyond just the roster in one of these episodes, and since this is a Smash game, there would be a ton beyond just the roster. So, let's talk stages. Let's start by writing down some of the stages for each of the various franchises that we've already included. For Halo, there's plenty of locations from the game's stories that you can include, but since the series is so famous for its multiplayer, you gotta include one of the maps in here. So I'm going to go with Valhalla. I was going to pick Blood Gulch since I feel like that's one of the most famous stages from the original game, but looking at it compared to later stages, there isn't really a whole lot there anymore. But I feel like Valhalla carries on the same spirit of that original stage, and the bases in the background are a nice iconic shot. You could have other Spartans driving around in warthogs firing off shots either just as background decorations or as stage hazards. Next, for Gears, I'm going to go with Embry Square. It's the opening stage of the very first game, and when I think of Gears, I think of destroyed landmarks and tons of waist-high cover, and this opening stage is nothing but that. Next, Minecraft. This one's easy. Just make a Minecraft stage. There's not really a lot to explain to this one. Just have it be a big grassy field where everything is made of blocks. However, to add some extra decorations to it, you could put some blocks on the stage and the fighters could punch these blocks apart to find items hidden inside. Then for Banjo, Smash already gave us Spiral Mountain, that's a nice iconic saying, so I say we go ahead and keep it. But I'd also give him a second stage that was Mumbo Jumbo's Hut. Next from the Battletoads, let's go with the Wookiee Hole. 
You know, that stage that you could never get past no matter how many times you rented this game from Blockbuster and it drove you insane and made you hate the game but you kept playing it anyways? Or maybe that was just me? You'd be on this platform that was slowly descending this long chasm while toad traps would keep reaching out from the side to try and attack you. And there would also occasionally be some ropes that would hang down from the ceiling as the platform was descending, and if you got knocked off the platform, then you could have a chance to save yourself by grabbing onto one of the ropes that would bring you back up. Next, moving to Killer Instinct, this one's easy, Ultratech Headquarters. Not only is it the big final boss stage in The Last KI, it's also a stage where you can actually knock the opponent off of it to their doom. Just like you could in a platform fighter. They've already done the work for us. Now, Joanna Dark stage has got to be Area 51. I know some people are going to say there's some far more iconic settings from the Perfect Dark games, and yes, you are correct about that. But how are you going to give me Area 51 in your video game, and then I don't turn that into a stage in our crossover game? Do you know how perfect the idea of an Area 51 stage is in a crossover game? You can load the background of it up with tons of aliens from all these other Xbox games for Easter eggs. There's no way I'm not taking this. Then for Sea of Thieves... Okay, again, Sea of Thieves is the one game in here that I know next to nothing about, but... Pirate Ship? I'm gonna say put it on a pirate ship and just have a Kraken attack it as a stage hazard. Does that work? I'm going to guess that works. Next, moving on to Bethesda titles. Starting with Doom, the obvious answer is just to make a stage out of hell. Just make a hell stage and then load with caco demons floating around as stage hazards, but if you destroy them, then they drop items. In fact, speaking of that, you could load this game's assist trophies up with tons of Doom demons. That is a must. But I'd also love to include another stage. Just a series of destroyed rooftops, and in the background, you would see the Icon of Sin rampaging around, destroying everything. Hey, maybe if you get a time over on that stage, then the Icon of Sin would come up to the foreground and then just destroy everything. Skyrim? Forget it! There's way too many good choices to pick just one. The Throw of the World, Sovngarde, heck, even just Whiterun would all be great choices. But no matter what stage you go with, on the Skyrim stage, halfway through the match, a dragon has to fly down and start burning everything up. Along those same lines, for Fallout, just set a stage in the wasteland and then halfway through the match, a big irradiated monster just starts rampaging around. But if you do want a stage that's a little bit more specific, let's go with New Vegas. I'm constantly hearing Fallout fans talk about how great New Vegas was, so let's set a stage on the New Vegas Strip. Then from Deathloop, listen, it's obviously going to be on the island of Black Reef, but it doesn't really matter where you decide to set it on there, as long as you get a shot of the big stabilizer antenna in the background, and every now and again, it just starts sending out little waves and signals. Maybe this stage could mess with time as well, like the match is about to end in a time over, then all of a sudden 30 more seconds get added to the clock, or a pulse goes out from the antenna, and then suddenly all the items that were used in the last minute reappear on the stage. Hey, over to Psychonauts, this is a hard one to pick because there are too many good stages. You could go with the basic standard choices like the campground from the first game or the mother love from the second, but if you want to get really creative, I say make the milkman's mind a stage. Just a winding, gravity-defying platform that breaks all the rules of physics in the game. Let's say that every now and again on this stage, if you knock someone off the screen, then there would be a chance that instead of being KO'd, they'd just get sent flying right back onto the stage from a completely different angle. Ori, put in the forest of Nibble where the game takes place, but let's have it be on a platform that's constantly moving. Let's have it be on a platform that's just swooping and sailing around the map because the Ori games look so good and the locations are so atmospheric that I would love for this stage to just keep constantly moving through them as you fight. They look too good to restrict yourself to just one spot. From Fable, I know that we're going with the hero from the second game, but as for the location, I'd go with either the Heroes Guild or the Witchwood Arena from the first game, simply because they're great places to set a fight, and because you could fit in tons of other characters in the background. Ninja Gaiden also has several stages that could work well. Hayabusa Village, Han's Bar, Sky City Tokyo, they'd all be great choices. But here is my weird location pick. Considering that Ryu isn't just here to represent Xbox's link to Ninja Gaiden, but also to Dead or Alive, I say put Zack Island in here as a stage to reference the volleyball games, because yes, they were also Xbox exclusives. And lastly, Blink's the Time Sweeper, set in the Time Factory where you see a ton of other time-hopping cats running around in the background cheering you on. Fairly simple. 
But we're not just going to do stages for the existing characters. No, there's tons of series that aren't in this game yet, but are still worth giving stages to. First up, Forza. You have to give Forza a stage. It's one of the biggest racing games on the planet. If it was possible, I'd put a car in this roster to represent that series. But you can't just put a car in your fighting game. Unless you're Sega. So yeah, let's put in here a big sweeping Mexican landscape to represent the latest game, and then have cars racing and jumping over hills in the background. Or, you know what? Let's go the F-Zero route and have you fight on top of the actual cars themselves as they're racing around a the track. Then let's put in here a stage for Senua's sacrifice. I was tempted to include Senua herself, but she doesn't really have a ton of moves and abilities. Plus, those games aren't really about the combat, more about dealing with traumatic mental issues and, uh... Yeah, I don't really trust myself to appropriately translate that into a fighting game. But you could totally give Senua a stage. Make it that village where suddenly everything just lights up on fire, and we can have it cut back and forth between reality and the inflamed illusion during the match. Next up, Grounded. I tried figuring out a way to turn the kids from Grounded into fighters, but I think we'd be better off just giving them a stage and making some of those kids assist trophies. Let's have all the fighters shrunk down and they're battling amongst giant blades of grass with giant household objects and bugs in the background. And you know, if there's any items we could put into this game that could shrink the opponent like the lightning bolt does in Smash Bros, we could have this stage set so that it just has a higher chance of those items showing up. Here's one that I know has some fans that have probably been waiting for me to mention it. Viva Pinata. We have to give Viva Pinata a stage. The color pattern and aesthetic of those games just begs for it. Then let's throw Zoo Tycoon in here as well. Just put your characters in a zoo, but in the background you can see exhibits constantly being picked up and moved around and new exhibits being dropped down. Almost like there's someone still controlling the stage and building the zoo around you. And hey, you know what? We haven't had anyone from Dishonored in here yet. So let's include the Clockwork Mansion. This has the potential to be one of the most gorgeous stages in the entire game, as it's constantly shifting and changing around you. Speaking of Bethesda properties, Quake has to have a stage in here. If you select that stage, then the announcer is replaced by the Quake announcer, who just starts counting down all your multi-kills. Here's a weird grab for you, Voodoo Vince. Yeah, one of those lesser known platformers from the sixth generation, it was a Microsoft title and was even worked on by Phil Spencer himself, so I feel like it deserves to have at least a little bit of representation in here, and I think its unique art style would be great for a stage. But alright, there's your roster and a healthy chunk of stages, so let's finish things off with a few seasons of DLC. If you watched this show before, then you know I like to do about 6 characters per season, and based on how Smash and other Smash clones have been operating, I think that's pretty feasible. And since Smash got 2 seasons of DLC, I'm going to do the same. So here we go with Season 1. <laughs> I've said it before and I'll say it again, season 1 of DLC for a fighting game is always meant to be the season for characters that felt like they should have been in the base roster but just couldn't make it. It is the season of DLC that helps the game to feel complete, so while these choices might not be that wild, they do feel like they're needed. Corvo Atano Dishonored is another huge tile for Bethesda and Corvo came so close to making it into the roster. He's got a super iconic and memorable look, and he's got tons of unique abilities like wind blast, teleporting, time bending. Heck, you could even have his big super just be him summoning out a wave of rats. Which makes me think that we should include that girl from A Plague's Tale as his Echo Fighter. I mean, it's on Game Pass, they have to have some kind of connection to Xbox. The only reason he didn't make it into the initial roster was because we were running into a problem of just too many characters with similar tones. I mean, we had a lot of characters from Bethesda who were all grisly serious first person fighters. So, someone had to get scrapped. But hey, we're in the DLC now, it's a fresh start, which means that we can bring in as many of those grisly first person characters as we want. Speaking of that, DJ Blaskowitz. I just mentioned how I didn't want to have too many characters with the same tone in this starting roster, meaning I didn't want to have too many characters who were just bang bang shooty men. Well, DJ Blaskowitz is the most bang bang shooty man in the history of video games. He does have a power suit and we could definitely give him some kind of abilities from there, but let's be real. When you think of BJ Blazkowicz, you think of a guy who just blows away seas of enemies. But he is super important to Bethesda, his games are very well received, and most importantly, if we are making an arcade ending for everyone, you have to put BJ in here so that way he can have an interaction with the Doom Slayer, who is canonically BJ Blazkowicz's great-grandson. 
If you're making a crossover between all the Xbox characters, that's an interaction that you have to get. Conquer! Alright, time for a more cartoony character, and you don't get much more cartoony than Conquer. There is so much variety to the levels in Conquer's game, and if we captured even a fraction of that, then his moveset would be one of the craziest in this entire game. Let him whack people with a frying pan, fly around with his tail, put on his army helmet when he blocks, do some Matrix-style slow-mo diving. Heck, for his big super, let him just pull out a T-Rex and he just starts eating people. I would love to put Conquer in here and then give him an arcade ending where all the big, brutal, tough guy characters are running in terror from him because Conquer's even more messed up than they are. Parvati. Outer Worlds might be one of the newer Microsoft acquisitions, but after one game, it's already made a big impact and has a sequel on the way. So let's go ahead and include a character from there. And if I had to pick one, I'm going to go with Parvati. Every time that I look into it, she's always being voted as one of, if not the most popular character in the game, and her weapon is a giant hammer. And if you're talking about what weapon is the best for a platform fighter, I'd say giant hammer is way up there. It's designed specifically to smash opponents off stages. Eddie Riggs. Eddie was the last character who I was forced to cut from the main roster. He got so close to being in the base game, but in the end, the other characters were just bigger names. Eddie was just too obscure. But it's DLC time, meaning now is the time for fan favorites, and Eddie is a total fan favorite. He's a rock star roadie who rides around in Dragulas, smacks opponents with an axe shaped guitar, and he's voiced by Jack Black. Who wouldn't want to see Jack Black fighting Master Chief? Cuphead. This is a Smash game, meaning even though we're sticking primarily with characters owned by the parent company, you gotta include some guest characters. And if we're talking about a modern breakout guest character with ties to Xbox, it's Cuphead. This game was one of the most anticipated indie titles for years, with people wondering if it was ever going to actually come out, but then Xbox stepped in, helped out with a little cash, and the game was able to be released. As an Xbox exclusive. Yes, when Cuphead launched, it was a console exclusive to the Xbox and stayed that way for two years. That was a big get, and it's enough for me to say Xbox could totally get Cuphead to be in this game. Heck, you could even put Mugman in here as half of his colors, and maybe even throw in Miss Chalice as a free Echo Fighter. And that is Season 1. Got a few more big names, a few more out there picks, and another semi-guest character. But now, we're heading into Season 2, the final season. And I always like the idea of having seasons of DLC based around specific themes. I think it gets people brainstorming if they have some kind of a hint of where things could go. And as for Season 2, you might have noticed so far there's something big that we're missing from this roster. Villains. Yeah, where are all the bad guys? If this is the last season, then we have to correct that. So let's end things by bringing on the bad guys, starting with... Atriox. We have to start with a Halo villain. As I point out multiple times, it's the number one Xbox franchise. So when it comes to villains from that series, I was tempted to put in here Eshram, seeing as how he's the newest villain, and also he trained Atriox. But yeah, forget about what the lore says, everywhere I look, I see people saying Atriox is the best baddie. I have looked up so many different Halo forums and videos and blogs to try and make sure that I could put in here a villain that would satisfy everyone, and Atriox is constantly being ranked as one of, if not the most popular villain. At least as far as villains who we could actually interpret easily into a fighting game. Not quite sure how we could put the Gravemind in here. That feels more like a stage hazard to me. But yeah, Atriox is super intimidating. You just hear this guy talk and you know he's a threat. And even though he hasn't appeared hardly at all in the main series, just the little cutscenes that we've seen of him make you realize what a threat he is. Anyone that can pound Master Chief into pace deserves to be in a fighting game. Queen Mira. Gotta have a villain from Gears in here as well, and I was tempted to go with General Ram because he was already in Killer Instinct, and if you haven't been able to tell by now, that's a pretty good indicator of what Xbox character could work in a fighting game. But I remember even when Ram got added to that game, people's reactions weren't really hyped, it was more of, why Ram? Why not one of the other characters? So instead, I'm going to go with Queen Mira, the leader of the Locust. 
Make her a super zoner and summon fighter. Let her just bring out all of her little locust minions to flood the screen and just keep the opponent away from her. And her big super move has to be her summoning out Tempest, the giant locust creature that she flies on top of. Davith. Doom is such a big series that it feels like a waste to only include one character from there and here. Problem is, all of the Doom Slayer's enemies are either the size of mountains, or they are so quickly dispatched that they don't really stick around long enough to be memorable. That is, until Davith popped up in Doom Eternal's DLC. He's the supreme ruler of hell, and he's loaded with weapons and abilities that would translate great into this game. He's got a sword, he's got bombs, he's got wolves that he can summon out. There are a ton of moves that we could give him to make him the perfect counter to the Doom Slayer. Gruntilda. Okay, again, we're starting to run the risk of getting too many big bang bang shooty guys in here. Halo, Gears, Doom, we need something very different from our next villain, and Gruntilda from Banjo-Kazooie is perfect for that. She's from another iconic franchise, She's been in multiple games, each of them with different looks, so that way she would have a ton of alternate costumes. And she's got plenty of moves that would be perfect in this game. She's got Magic Blast for her basic special, she can ride a broom for good off-screen recovery, and she's even got a giant robot that she can summon out for her super move. This is an easy pick. Jack of Blades. Fable is another series that, even if we haven't gotten a new installment in so long, it is important enough for Xbox that it does deserve to have another character in this roster. And even if we weren't sticking with the villain theme for this season, I would still throw Jack of Blades in here. Not only do they have a great design, but he's also one of the only Fable characters to appear in multiple games. And as for their moveset, they have so much that we can pull from. I mean, in the second game, they become a dragon. Is there a better ultimate super move than turning into a dragon? I think not. Hisako. And for the final character of this season pass... Okay, I know that Hisako isn't exactly a villain. In fact, she's fighting against the true villain of the game. But you know something? She's a grudge ghost that jump scares you to death and she killed countless people while she was alive. I'm counting her as a villain. Plus, honestly, she was the biggest breakout star of The Last Killer Instinct, and fans love her so much that I had to fit her in here somewhere. And she's close enough to fitting the criteria for this season of DLC, so I'm taking it. If anybody still has a problem with it, then you know what? This is my one just-for-me pick for this roster, okay? I had to do it. And there you have your full, complete roster for X-Smash. Eh, it's starting to grow on me. As I said, this is one of those games that people have been asking me to do for the longest time, but I was kind of nervous about tackling it because I didn't know if it was even possible. But after diving into it, not only does it seem possible, it seems almost mandatory. Come on Microsoft, if you're going to own everything under the sun, then at least give us a good crossover game. Otherwise, what's the point of being a giant megalomaniacal monopoly? Oh well, maybe one day. But what do you think? What massive, huge, important title did I forget to bring up? What character should I have chosen? Do you think there's too many Halo characters? Not enough Halo characters. Where's Clippy? How could you not put Clippy the paperclip in your Xbox Smash game? Because he would be an assist trophy who fills up the screen with annoying word bubbles asking if you need help. Or he would be the guide in the tutorial. There, for everyone who's been asking about Clippy, I see you. I knew some of you were going to be asking it. So there's your answer. Enjoy. And if you like this video, then take a look around and think about hitting that subscribe button. We do fun stuff about fine games like this all the time, so check us out. And if you like what you see, then think about helping us hit that 80,000 subscriber goal by the end of the year. I know the year just began, but it's never too early to start subscribing. And if you're already a subscriber and you want to continue supporting us, then give us a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, and think about hanging over to our Patreon by following the link in the description down below. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there, and come back next time.